I invite you to open up your Bibles to the gospel lesson for today, to Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. It's on page 1623 uh, in your Bibles. So imagine your wife, or ki- your wife and kids are drowning in a pond, and you can only save one of them. Who are you going to save? It used to be a scenario we'd put in front of people, like in a classroom setting, just to kind of test where you're at in life and, and get you to make tough decisions. And my answer to that was always, get the heck out of my way, I'm saving them all. Don't tell me I can't save one of them, right? You know, because they're too important to me. I love them. I can't, I can't stand thinking of losing them. I can't, I can't make a choice like that. I'm going to get them all. They're all precious to me. And, and, uh, and I can't say, well, you know what, if I get one, well, at least I got one, you know, kind of thing. I can't feel good about not getting them all, right? You can't feel good about that. You want every single one of them, and, and you're going to be Superman. You're going to, the adrenaline's going to be flowing, and you're going to do whatever you have to do, whatever it takes to do to get them there, if it kills you. You're going to do it, right? And the reason you're going to do it is because they're a lot more important than those blocks that I had in front of you for the children's lesson, but every single one of them is precious to you. Well, it's in that kind of setting that Jesus tells this story about how oftentimes we look at people and we kind of size people up in our own way and yet how God looks at us and how God loves every single one of us. Three parables. Three parables about things that are lost, people who are lost. And three parables that tell the story of one who goes and seeks after them. And the context of that is just what I said to you. In verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathered all around to hear Jesus. And here's the reaction of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were muttering. (laughs) And I love muttering because, well, I don't love muttering. Because muttering is is kind of under your breath kind of thing, hoping nobody else will hear you. Kind of in my own private little world. Kind of in my navel-gazing, you know, self-righteous kind of a a world where I'm assuming I'm all right and everything's okay. uh, But I don't want someone else to hear that. Except the thing about God is that, just as in this story, Jesus hears the muttering. And he knows what they're thinking. And he knows our heart. And we betray ourselves. We, we said it a moment ago in the, in the confession. We, we said to God, God, I know I'm sitting against you in thought, word, and deed. I admit that to you. And I admit to you, God, in my, uh, in my shame, that, that God, I haven't always looked at people as you look at them. I, I, I've let some be lost, and, and that's okay with me. And I know I shouldn't be okay with that. That there are, there are people in my very lives that, that I've turned my back on, and I, and I no longer feel sorry for, for the condition that they're in, away from you. And, and that ties in so well with 9-11, too. Because as, as you and I as a Christian look at 9-11, we also need to look at, uh, for instance, the people flying the planes. People who masterminded the flying of the planes are lost people. They are lost and without the true God. And those that died in those accidents, quote, most likely went to hell. And that ought to bother us, too. Because... Jesus doesn't say in the parable that it's okay if you lose just one out of 99 sheep. It's okay if you lose just one out of two or out of 10 coins. It's okay if you lose just one out of the two sons. Notice how the numbers are going down. It's not okay. And to God, every single person is important to him. We say that by, in a way, doing a country fair, right? We say this community is so important that we want to open up to this community and invite anybody who wants to come to our country fair to come here. Even though some are going to come in the building and are not going to wipe their feet properly and they might drag some mud onto the carpet or they might spill something here or there in the building. It's our building, right? No. It's God's church. It's what he's blessed us with. And he's called us to do ministry here, to reach out to every single person. And some of them may aggravate us about how, they, how and where they might park in the parking lot or how they act at a certain table or this or that, or how they might bargain or something like that. But look at every single one of them as someone precious to God. And we're doing that. We do the same thing in running a food pantry. Where we tell people in our community, we're here if you need some help with, with getting some food and groceries and things like that, others in the world may look at them and say whatever they say, but we say we've got to open our heart. We've we, we got to do this. This is people who are precious to God. Same way at St. Matthew in Chicago. In the Pilsen community, in a very poor community, homeless and such, we said we've got to be there because they are what some might consider the tax collectors and sinners of our world. But we need to be there. And you are. You are there in heart. 
You are there with your pocketbook as well in your gifts that you give. You are there in your presence as you go to help out with one of the meals that happens there at Thanksgiving time or at Christmas time. You said that's important. You've also said, too, in your support of prison ministry, Deaconess Lori Wilbert, you said those are the tax collectors and sinners of our world, too, and we got to be there. We have to be there. They're precious to God. They're people who, who, who Jesus Christ came and died for. And Alaska's the same way. And so you've supported that again with your prayers, with your questions, with your interests, with your, with your pocketbook, too. And you've said that all these things are important. you said, and we should, we love you. We love you because Jesus loves you. And we love you because we are an expression of God's love to you. But it's a challenge, isn't it? It's so easy to fall into the same trap that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did in our gospel lesson for today. It's so easy to listen to the rest of the world and their opinion of people in those situations until we forget, until we forget, or unless we remember, that at one time we were lost too that we were lost. By the grace of God for many of us, like myself, we were brought up in a Christian home where we were brought to the water of holy baptism. We were baptized as an infant. We were brought up in a Christian home where, where uh, we learned about Jesus Christ from the very beginning of our life, some later on in your life. But at some point, God found you. The parables and the point of the parables is that no one of those, that lost sheep didn't come walking back by himself. That lost coin didn't come jumping out and saying, here I am, come and find me. That, that lost son didn't come back until he hit rock bottom. And even when he came back, he didn't come back thinking he's going to be a son. He thought, at least if I could be a slave. And the older son, well, hopefully that's not us. But he can be. And we praise God that when his people broke all 10 commandments all at once, and Moses symbolized it by slamming them down on the ground, God didn't say, okay, they're to pieces now, it's all done. But he said, come on up, Moses, I'll give you a second set. Because I love my people, because I love you, because you are precious to me, I can't give up on you. I can't say, well, I can only save a couple of you. No, I want you all. And that's a beautiful picture of our Lord. When you look, look at verse three in the text, it says, so Jesus told them this parable. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? You see, it's interesting about that word lost. It isn't just that thing that happened to me when I was a little kid and I was with my, grand, with my mom in the grocery store and I kind of went down one aisle and mom went down another aisle and then I looked up and I go, ah! Where are you at, mom? And started screaming. We're not talking just that kind of lost. That word is the same word that's used in a very precious passage to us, John 3, 16. It can also be translated as destroyed or perished. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not, say it, perish. Same word, be lost. We're talking that kind of lost. We're talking don't know God. We're talking going to go to hell if they die this way. That's the kind of lost we're talking about here. All three parables, that's the word that's used. It's this, it's this perishing, being destroyed. And Jesus is screaming out to us and saying that God is not okay with that and that we ought not to be okay with that too. And he says there's greater joy in heaven. There's incredible joy in heaven when one who is lost is found. And see, so here's the thing, is that we live in a world, and maybe it's no different in any other time, where unfortunately people around us probably don't know they're lost. They're probably all guys, right? Because I'm not lost, right? I know exactly where I'm going. I'm just taking the scenic route. We'll get there eventually. Right? But that's the way our world is, right? We live amongst people who don't know they're lost. They don't see any problem, everything's okay. Maybe a 9-11 happens, 2001, it kind of rocks their boat for a while, but then we kind of slide right back into it. And here's the thing, as Christians, we can't be okay with that. We can't say, oh well, but it's gotta hurt us. It's gotta draw us. 
It's got to tug on us. Because God didn't say, you broke the first 10 commandments, I'm not going to give you any more. He gave Moses another one. And he never gives up on us. The Old Testament word is that he is long-suffering, huh? Ever made God suffer for you? Oh yeah, we have. And yet he's long-suffering for us. And he calls us to have that same kind of heart. And it's interesting in the, in the parables of the things that he chooses to use, one of them is about sheep. You said it a moment ago in the confession, you, you, you quoted the text from Ezekiel where God says he has sent his shepherd out to bring us back his lost sheep. You see, I, I would have wished that, that, that Jesus would have referred to us as like somebody a little, little more, a little more stronger, like lions or wolves or eagles or something like that. But the reference that he always uses for us is what? The song I learned in Sunday school, I am Jesus little what? Lamb. I want to be his lion. I want to be his bear. I want to be his eagle. But no, what does he liken us to? A lamb. Kind of like that helpless feeling we had on 9-11-2001 as we watched that on the television and we said we cannot do anything about it. We can't stop it. Remember that helpless feeling that you had? Well, that's really the way we are in reality all the time. We can't find God. We can't control the future. We can't even control the present. We are truly like a lamb, helpless and unable to change things by ourselves. But <laughs> we are lambs who have an incredible shepherd. We are lambs who walk, have a shepherd who walks with us through every phase of our lives. We are lambs that have that good shepherd. And he rejoices. He rejoices in finding us. In each of the parables, it says that, that when, when that one gets lost, that the, that the shepherd goes, the woman goes, the, 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 even, even the father goes, and they find the one that's lost. And that word found is where we get our word. Well, maybe it's a word you hear every once in a while out on the bargain table. When, when someone goes through some things on the bargain table and they find something that they didn't know was there and they might say something like, maybe not this word, but they'd say something like, Eureka! That's the Greek word for found. It is. So that when God finds someone and they come to know Jesus Christ, the angels go, Eureka. They do. They go, Eureka. What was lost is now found. And he calls us to have that same kind of joy too. That, that great joy because you, you found a person who was, remember, lost, destroyed, perishing. And he calls us to have that same kind of love. And we do. I mentioned all those things. Country fair, food pantry, St. Matthew, prison ministry, Alaska. Individual things that you do every single day. That person that asks for help and it tugs at your heart and you open your wallet and you help them out. That person that says, hey, I got this or that going on, you say, I'm going to pray for you, right? That, that neighbor, that coworker, that student that's just struggling and your heart goes out to them and you wonder why it does. Well, you know why it does. Because you are made in the image of who? Of God. And so you hurt the same way that God does. We sang the song just a little bit ago. We used to call it the red shirt anthem, right? They'll know we are Christians by our what? Our love. But just one thing about that too. It's not only our love for other people, but it's also our love for each other. What a witness it is to our world when you and I work together. When, when our world looks at the church and looks at Christians and sees, wow, those are people who love each other. Those are people who forgive each other, who cut each other a break, who go the extra mile for each other. And what a witness that is to the world. It's a challenge though, isn't it? Country Fair kind of brings that out in us, doesn't it? Just as any tense time brings it out in a family, where sometimes we're, uh, we get a little short with each other, we don't always say the kindest things to one another, and sometimes we hurt each other. And that happens. And Satan would love for that to happen, because you see, he's no dummy. He knows that if we, he can get us to infight, we're not going to fight against the one who is really the enemy. So take a look around you. Those are brothers and sisters in Christ around you. You're family. We are family. These are people that we love and people who are loved by God. And what a witness it is to the world when we love each other and they look at that church and they look at us and they say, man, those people really love each other. Because you see, the Bible says that 
the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the church of God. Did you catch that? The gates of hell will not be able to withstand the church of God. In other words, when we love each other, Satan knows he's done for. And last time I looked, a gate was not an offensive weapon. It's a defensive weapon. He's trying to stop us from doing something. And Jesus promised that when we are the church, when we truly live as the church, when we love each other and we work together as his church, the gates of hell will not be able to withstand it. And so that's what we do. One more thing. That 10 coins, those 10 silver coins that the woman had in the story that Jesus told could possibly be an example of a dowry that a woman would have in those days. A dowry. And of course, you get a dowry because you are what? You are married. Well, she represents us in a way. Because we are married. We are married to Jesus Christ. And he is our precious bride. And he has won us. And he has bought us, not with, say good Lutherans, gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. You are a child of God. You are so precious to God that he loved you. He is like the perfect husband to you in that he's given his life for you. And nothing will separate you from him and from his love in Jesus Christ. And so, found ones of God, found ones of Jesus Christ. Love his world and love his people. And let the world know that we are Christians by our love, both for them and for each other. And may God continue to bless the work that we do together. In Jesus' name, amen.